what the title of the sermon was and hadn't thought about giving it a title. So as I was thinking, as we sat here, um, I guess briefly I would say the title is Don't Complain, Get Help. Don't Complain, Get Help. So I'm speaking from uh, Numbers 11. I was asked to talk about leadership in the Old Testament and how that might relate to us now in the New Testament. And uh, sorry, I'm a teacher, so I'm going to say a few things first. And obviously, not everything in the Old Testament applies to us. We have to do very careful hermeneutic study of the Bible to know which parts are part for us and which parts are not. For instance, the church is not called to execute people who commit adultery. Some Re Re Reformation figures thought that was the case. So it's important that we, we get a good grasp on, on the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. At the same time, the Old Testament does give us exemplars or examples or precedents of things that do follow through. And in this particular passage in Numbers 11, we're told about how Moses appoints 70 elders. And the word in Hebrew is literally old men, not just anybody, but old men to help him deal with the people. And maybe his day, the old men were more respected, but they were definitely old men. And God pours out his spirit upon these 70 in the same way that he had poured out his spirit on Moses. So Moses needed help. God gave him the 70 elders and he poured out his spirit on, on them. So the context of this passage is about the people of Israel complaining. They, they complain. You read the history of the people in, in, the, in the desert, they complained a lot. And they started complaining against manna. Probably you've heard somebody say that manna is Hebrew for mana. What is it? They didn't know what it was. They didn't know what to call it. So they, they named it, what is it? Mana. And it was apparently a good thing to eat. It had some properties that when it was mashed, it changed a little bit, became like all the oil. But the main thing was that the people started to complain. We're sick of this manna, manna. too much manna. I don't know if any of you remember Keith Green, but he had a song about, we want to go back to Egypt. Well, this is that, that passage. We want to go back to Egypt. We're sick of the manna. We want to go back to Egypt. And their complaint is absolutely ridiculous. The Egyptians didn't give them leeks and onions. They gave them straw. They wouldn't even give them straw to make their bricks. They were slaves, but they have this sort of, romanticized idea about what it was like in Egypt. And granted, the place that they were in was very desolate. The, the desert they were in uh, didn't provide for them, but God did, and they complained. And then Moses complains. <laughs> and this is not the first time he's made this sort of complaint, but he says, this is just too much for me. I can't carry the weight of these people. There's just too many. There are 600,000 fighting men. So, yeah, if you kind of try to do the math and say, well, 600,000 men, 600,000 wives, two or four kids for, for a couple old people that are still around, probably about 2 million people. This is an extremely large group of people to feed and an extremely large group of people to govern. And he was basically their governor. This reminded me in the New Testament when Jesus says to the apostles, uh, they come to him and they say, you know, you should send the crowds away. It's getting late. They need to eat. I send them away to get something to eat. And Jesus looks at them and he says, you feed them. And they say, bah, 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 bah. it would take months of wages to do this. And let me just read the passage. Jesus said, you feed them. And they say, with what? We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. Jesus asked, how much bread do you have? Go and find out. They came back and reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. Then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. And Jesus took the five loaves and the two, two fish, and he looked up to heaven. He blessed them. He prayed. Then he broke the lave. He was breaking those loaves into pieces, and he kept giving the bread to the people. It's not like he broke it and then he gave it, but he kept giving it, kept giving it, kept giving it. It was clear that he was multiplying it, and they distributed it, that bread to all the people, and they gave people as much fish as they wanted. They all ate all that they wanted, and afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets full of 
leftover bread and fish. And there were about 5,000 men and their families that day. So at least about 20,000 people. Um, so the disciples saying, how can we do this? We can't do this. This is too much. Moses has the same sort of reaction. And yet when we think about Moses, what had he already seen God do? He'd seen the 10 plagues, right? He'd seen God destroy the Egyptians. He saw the sea open and close on Pharaoh's army. He himself had lifted the staff and opened the sea. And yet here he is in the desert. He's tired and he starts to complain. Now I'm going to speculate a little bit. Uh, why does Moses complain? Well, first of all, it seems like we get the idea from the scripture that he had a weak self-image. Maybe it had to do with being driven out of Egypt when he murdered the man and had to go and hide in the desert. He saw himself as nothing more than a shepherd. Uh, but he said to God at one point, make my brother Aaron the spokesman. I don't speak well. So he was constantly sort of shifting things uh, toward other people. And in this case, with the feeding, he'd already seen uh, the, the water separated. Maybe this is a little speculation, but he was an Egyptian prince. Right? He was raised by the Pharaoh's daughter, so I assume he knew how to read and write. He wasn't just any old shepherd. I think Moses was just plain tired. They'd been in the desert a long time. Uh, he was basically the judge or the, uh, the person that they would come to to intermediate, to mediate between people, and he just was Tired, constant complaining, constant whining, and he was just worn out. He even went so far as to suggest that God should just kill him. I can't stand it anymore. Just kill me. Well, I think you're going to have a session about depression after this. When people are very depressed, sometimes they reach that point. I can't carry this anymore. Just too much. And Moses, Moses was tired. But God doesn't rebuke Moses about being tired outrightly. And that reminded me of Elijah. We were just singing the days of Elijah. Right? So in the days of Elijah, what happened? God said to Elijah, go up, put that altar on the top of the mountain with the 400 prophets of Baal around you, pray, and I will, I will perform a miracle. And so what happens? You know, the, the, the 400 priests of Baal, you know, they put up their altar and they're dancing around and they're slashing themselves and they're all doing all sorts of things. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. And finally, after a while, Moses, um, Elijah's teasing them, where's your God? Is he literally in the, in the uh, restroom? <laughs> is, is your God not listening? And so finally, uh, Elijah says, okay, pour water over the, over the altar. Pour more water over it. Pour more water over it until it's just flooded. And he doesn't do anything fancy. He doesn't dance. He doesn't spin. He has no... Uh, show involved he just says okay lord do it <laughs> fire falls the whole altar burn up everything's burned up not just a sacrifice and so elijah has this great miracle that he's done but then he's called upon to do something that i know i would find very hard he's called upon to be the executioner of the prophet of Baal, the prophets of Baal. so basically he i don't know if he overseed he oversaw oversaw the people that did the uh, executing, whether he himself executed them, but 400 people were executed that day. I think that would bother anybody, even if you knew you were doing the right thing. So between that and, and between knowing that Jezebel will be after him, he runs off into the wilderness. And twice, he, he falls asleep under a, a broom tree, a big, big bush, basically, and God sends an angel to feed him and to give him give him drink. And that happens twice. And both times he says, just kill me. Just kill me. I'm done. Just kill me. And God's not ready to kill him. And he, he eventually finds Elijah hiding in the cave. And God says, what are you doing here? Why are you hiding in this cave? He says, I've, been, I've been zealous for the Lord, but nobody else is on my side. This, this woman, she's after me. And God's point is, I was there before, and I'll be there afterward. You don't need to fear her. Um, and yet it was very hard for him. He, he, again, also said he wanted to die, but God didn't, didn't do that. But God did transfer the, the power of the prophet, the leadership, from Elijah to Elisha. 
So God seemed to know that Elijah was tired. It was time for replacement. Another thing I would say about Moses complaining is that, in a way, it led from his being excluded from the promised land. Now, okay, specifically, it says he struck the rock. Because he struck the rock, he was excluded. But this pattern that he had of complaining and not trusting God was something that continued. And when the people complained about not having water and he went up and struck the rock, that was disobeying God's command. God didn't tell him to strike the rock, but he was angry. He did something that was done in anger, and as a result, he didn't obey God in the sense he didn't give God the glory. And this generation of men that, that were in the wilderness seem to have a perpetual problem. They just don't trust God. And so what happens later, you have the 12 spies sent into the promised land. They look around and go, wow, this is a great place. Look at all this fruit. Look at all this produce that's been growing. Look at this beautiful land. And they come back with a So it's a, it's a land flowing in rich in milk and honey, exactly as they were told. But they see these very tall warriors, <laughs> the men of this land, and they're afraid. And they come back and they give a bad report. And the bad report is that they were afraid. And they told the people, we can't do this. We shouldn't go up against these people because they could, they could kill us. They're sons of the giants. And that, that kind of lack of faith is something that unfortunately we even see in Moses, we've seen in Elijah. People who do great things for God on one, one occasion can fail on other occasions. And that's because we're human. You know, we get worn out. Um, we get tired. I think when I was younger, I didn't want to admit that I needed any help. But when you reach a certain point, you have to have help. Maybe the older you get, the more wise you get, you know you need help. And so God doesn't really punish Moses for complaining. He, he in, the, in the end, punishes him for direct disobedience. And I guess the point I want to make here is that God doesn't punish us because we're weak. He doesn't punish us because we have an illness, because we need help. But if we start a habit of complaining, as the people of Israel did, as Moses did, it's very hard to break. I'm not preaching at you, you know, the thing about I'm, my, my one finger's pointing back at me <laughs> if I'm preaching. Um, I have the joy of having my brother and or my brother-in-law, my sister, and my daughter and my granddaughter and my wife here today. And um, my grandfather McVeigh, whom I'd like to talk about for a little bit, was a very simple man. He hadn't graduated from grade school. He had to go work when he was 10 years old. He had a job with his brother of driving a wagon with a mule up this very steep hill in Pittsburgh to deliver ice to people to put in their ice boxes. He was the one of seven brothers and one sister in his very poor Scotch-Irish, as he used to say, family. And later, he became an electrical lineman with the county, it's the county electric company, even though he was red, green, colorblind, which is something I inherited. <laughs> but he worked at, at that job for 40 years, and in the process in, in between, he found time to complete his GED, his examination for a high school diploma. My grandfather was a Methodist deacon when he died at church closed. I'm not kidding, literally that church closed. He loved to sing hymns like Up From the Grave He Rose. He sang it with great gusto, and he had a voice like a bullfrog. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily lovely, but it was enthusiastic. He made a joyful noise to the Lord. Uh, my grandfather realized at some point early on in his adult life that nobody liked their complaints. And he was struggling with that sort of thing himself. And he found some help, whatever you think about these sources, but he found help from Andrew Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people. He found help from Norman Vincent Peale, who was a positive, positive thinking kind of advocate. And he worked very consciously to be positive and not complain. I mean, he, he could have complained. Very poor as a young man. He worked very, very hard through his life. He lived through consciously at least one world war, if not two. He lived through the Great Depression. He had lots of reasons he could have complained. Uh, but he tried to do what the Apostle Paul says. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, 
but only such a word as is good for building up the hearers. Now, when I was a young Christian in college, we memorized that verse, and the idea was, don't swear, don't curse. Well, you can be included in that, but Paul is speaking about something broader than that. Don't give a bad report if you want to go back to the false spies. So speaking something positive, uh, speaking something good is something we ought to do. And uh, my grandfather was known to be somebody that joked. I don't know how that sits with you all, but he had a joke all the time. So if anybody started to complain, he'd tell a joke. He'd turn the conversation. He was very adept at diffusing things in that way. And he worked at that. And so I, I feel like I haven't attained it, but I feel like it's an example I have from my past of one of my forebears who made wise choices. So when Moses complains, uh, God says, all right, find 70 old men and point them to be with you as those who will lead, those who will judge, those who will give instruction. He gives him instruction on how to choose those helpers and to appoint them. But not only does God appoint them, but he puts on them his spirit. And generally speaking, in the Old Testament, the spirit of God is only on God's prophets. The spirit of God comes on the anointed one, the Messiah, but not on general people. So for the Holy Spirit to come upon these 70 means God recognizes them in a very special way. They're being given wisdom and power from God to make wise decisions and wise judgments. And then God responds to the people. First, he says, you want quail? You're going to have quail till it's coming out of your nostrils. You're going to be sick of it. You won't want any quail after this. So not only does he provide the meat that they argue for or want, he gives them much more than they really could deal with to show that he was able to provide. And according to the text, some of those who complained died. Punished them for that. So conclusions, first be happy with what God has given you. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. If we're, if we're constantly seeking more and more and more, um, that's not what God wants for us. He wants us to be content with what we have. That doesn't mean that ambition is necessarily wrong, but it means that the focus of our life should not be our things, our stuff. As I mentioned, Moses had a bad habit of complaining, and the people had a bad habit of complaining. And I would repeat again uh, that verse, uh, Ephesians 4, 29. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only such a word as is good for building up the hearers. And think about that in broader terms. I, I have a difficult time, and if I become bitter about some situation, I keep hashing, rehashing, hashing, rehashing. That doesn't go anywhere. And I struggle. I really struggle to try to be positive in some situations. And, and I would ask actually, as we go to this new assignment that we will have in Romania, we're moving into a new team. Don't really know any of those people. I don't know how it's gonna go. Uh, although I've had enough missionary to experience to know there are gonna be problems. There are gonna be difficulties. Some people are gonna be hard to work with. I'm hard to work with. So pray for us that we can find a way to be positive in this situation. Uh, secondly, or thirdly, uh, God will provide. Moses says, here I am among 600,000 men on foot, and you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month. Would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? They've got animals with them. Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? What does God say to Moses? Is the Lord's arm too short? Is the Lord's arm too short? Now you will see whether or not what I say will come through for you. So though Moses had seen all this rich provision in the past, he's still struggling with this. And God does provide. So uh, I had a calling uh, from the Lord when I was 17 to become a missionary to Russian-speaking young people. And so my life from that point on was aimed at, I did Russian language in college. We went as missionaries to Yugoslavia because Russia wasn't open. At the time, and our whole career, our whole lives, basically, has been this missionary career. And uh, we were appointed initially by a ministry called Greater Europe Mission, as known as the Bible Institute Mission. It had planted 10 Bible Institutes and three seminaries around Europe. 
and we were going to go to communist Yugoslavia to learn the language, Serbo-Croatian or Serbian, and teach in a Bible school for Yugoslav students. And we had come back from Chicago where I went to school and we were living with my parents, wife Linda, and new, newborn Beth, who's now almost 40 years old. <laughs> uh, and I was walking up the street that I grew up on and I happened upon a, a friend of my mother's and a person I knew well. She had been our Cub Scout then leader, Mrs. Benson. And Shirley Benson was a hard worker. She was a Roman Catholic and five children. She worked really hard to send her children to parochial school. It was a hard life for her. Uh, but as we were talking, she asked me what was happening. And I said, well, we're appointed as missionaries and we're going to go to a communist country, an Eastern European country. We couldn't say which one at the time. And we needed to raise $1,978 a month. I'm waiting for, for Barry to laugh at that number. But yeah, this is a ridiculously low number now and twenty thousand dollars for outgoing expenses so shipping things your first card and her jaw dropped how are you going to do that from her frame of reference that was just insane it was actually insane for most of my family we grew up in the lutheran church we went to the lutheran seminary we were appointed by the lutheran church the missionaries they sent you and they paid your salary and so the whole idea of having to raise your own salary was just kind of absolutely crazy so I told her we would speak in churches and speak to individuals. And once the money was raised, we'd be allowed to go. And she wished me good luck. I'm not sure what she expected, but she wished me good luck. But God did provide. And through the years, and I mean now, we're talking almost four decades, the Lord has provided for us over and over and over again. Uh, he's blessed us when we were pursuing theological education and missionary training, a couple relatives at different points gave us significant gifts or paid for our tuition. Uh, since we've become missionaries, we've had people support us for almost four decades. God has supplied. We never expected, for instance, to be able to own a home. This was something that the missionaries could manage, but one relative gave us a very large sum of money, which enabled us to buy a house. And that house enabled us to pay off our kids' college debts, at least our part of it. <laughs> And it, when we sold that house, we got so much money for it, I was just flabbergasted. When the realtor told us what we're going to get, literally my jaw hit the table at that point. And the Lord provided for us so that we were able to even buy a home here. So we, we have a home to, to let other people use in the meantime, and then we'll, we'll have a home come back. We served, as Barry said, for 20 years at the Tyndale Theological Seminary, which is just outside of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And I don't want to get into all the details, maybe, but it wasn't where we expected to be. It wasn't what I wanted to do, uh, per se. But the Lord guided us there, and it became a very uh, fruitful place for ministry. It was a good place for our children. We had that option of buying a house, and it just really uh, it was really a blessing. And if I were to say now, the Lord had to provide $1,978 a month, probably times that now, something like that. And the $20,000, well, that's been provided over and over and over. I, I can't even add it up. I don't know how I would add it up. It's just been incredible. God has provided. And it's always been miraculous. As the great missionary to China, Hudson Taylor, said, God's work, God's work done in God's way shall not lack God's supply. God's work done in God's way shall not lack supply. So kind of con combining the don't complain with this theme, there's an old hymn which goes, count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. So if we look back on what God has done, how he has blessed us, it's easy to stay positive. And how has God blessed you? With a home, with a car, with a job, with a spouse, with children? Count your many blessings rather than complain. And the final thing uh, that I draw as a conclusion, and I hope that it's encouraging to you as well, that God will pour out and has poured out his spirit on all people, not just on the 70, but in Joel 28, 29, it says, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. 
Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And you know, this is the passage that Peter refers to on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit falls on people. And so it's not now just a small group of people whom God has put a spirit on, but it's all of God's people who have the spirit. So we should have that power, that Holy Spirit given power in our life and that wisdom to live for God in the way that we should. Paul says in Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are one, all one in Christ Jesus. So the Holy Spirit has been poured upon, upon all uh, people. To give a comparison, um, those of us in the, the free church movement or in the um, non-sacramental tradition don't believe in priests right? we don't believe that there's only certain people who can go forward to the altar and, and do the eucharist and provide that blessing to us all people are god's servants all people are god's priests we call that in the protestant tradition the priesthood of the believer all of us are called by god to serve all of us are given strength to serve so in these New Testament days, God is using both men and women to advance his kingdom, and he, pour, he has poured out his spirit on both men and women, and both are called and able to do ministry. We thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us with new birth in your son, that your son died for us, that he rose again, and that he has sent his spirit to live in us, and poured his spirit out upon us, and we pray that you would help us to follow his lead in our lives, to rely upon you and upon the Holy Spirit for strength and for provision. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.